words. To but the implication here is, as we start Parshas Bo, the implication here is that Moshe is supposed to say these things to Paro. So let's take Boel Paro, take the following, bring the following to Paro. I have hardened his heart. And that's how the art school people render it. I've made his heart, uh, his heart and the heart of his servant stubborn. We'll see the Xtava Kabbalah has a different interpretation. Uh, the hearts of his servants. The man she see also so that I can put these signs of mine in his midst. Now the next possible the simple understanding is Hashem says to Moshe, this is so that you, Moshe, will tell your children and your grandchildren. In other words, you, the Jewish people, will uh, be able to convey, to transmit this memory, this important lesson. Now, again, the art school people render it how I made a mockery of Egypt. And that is how Rashi explains it. We'll see Ksavah Kabbalah has a different uh, a thought about that as well. There's also Sashir Samtivam and my signs that I place within them, and you will know that I am God. So according to Ksavah Kabbalah, Moshe is supposed to bring to Paro the following. He's supposed to bring to Paro the fact that I've hardened your heart and the hearts of your servants for the purpose of placing these wonders, these signs, Bikirbo, in your midst. Now, Bikirbo is in the third person, but Ksava Kabbalah points out that we often find a, uh, like a communication in which the uh, Pasuk begins in the second person and then moves to the third person, or the other way around, starts in the third person and proceeds in the second person. We often find that it's not at all unusual. So again, Moshe, according to our understanding, Moshe is instructive to say the following to Paro, that Hashem has hardened your heart for the purpose of placing these wonders in your midst. And so that you, Paro, will tell your uh, uh, son and grandchildren, how I have made a mockery, we'll see a different interpretation in due course, B'Mitzrayim, and Samti Vam, again, my signs that I place within you, Vidatem Kenya Hashem, you will know that I am God. So, Ksavah Kabbalah makes the following, uh, uh, constructs the following edifice. He says, the purpose of these plagues is, and the Torah calls them consistently, osos. Osos are sides. We've seen it right here twice in these first two verses, ososai. The, Hashem doesn't describe them as plagues. We know them as the 10 plagues. But the Torah repeatedly describes them as wonders and as signs. According to the Ksavah Kabbalah, the whole purpose of these plagues, the whole purpose of Hashem revealing himself in these supernatural uh, ways by uh, like uh, exploiting or, or changing the course of nature to the detriment of the Mitzvim, it's not primarily to extricate the Jewish people from Egypt. Of course, Hashem could have done that without any plagues at all. He could have just stimmied the Egyptians and enabled the Jewish people to leave in peace and at a time of their choosing. That wasn't the way Hashem chose to go about it. And here we see why. Because the purpose of all of these plagues is so that Paro will tell, so that Paro will realize, and he will tell his progeny and his um, uh uh, descendants, those who come after him, of course, Paro symbolizing the leadership and the, uh, the let's say, uh, uh, cultural um, uh, power within, within Egypt itself. We'll see this idea expanded further in just a moment. The Torah says it repeatedly, like, we had it in last week's parish. If you take a look at chapter 9, verse 17. Uh, if you've got the art score, it's on page 336, verse 17. Uh, 16, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this is why I have kept you going. 
Hashem says to Paro through Moshe, this is why I have allowed you to remain standing, so that I can show you my power, and to tell of my name in all the world. In other words, Paro is an eyewitness to the devastation of Egypt. Paro is an eyewitness to the revelation of Hashem as the one who controls nature and who controls human affairs as well. Uh, Ksava Kabbalah uh, supports his view by quoting the Midrashic tradition, which is subject to two different opinions in the Midrash, but we have the opinion of Rabbi Nehemiah, who says that Paro did not die as a result of the plagues, nor did he die as a result of the plague of the firstborn, and he was a firstborn, nor did he die even at the splitting of the sea. Now, the simple understanding of the narrative is that Paro finally met his watery grave at the splitting of the sea because he led the charge to seek to recapture the Jewish people, all the chariots and all the officers and all of the, the might of Egypt, whatever was left of it, whatever the, the uh, hail, uh, you know, whoever survived the hail. So Paro was at the head of the of the, uh, the vanguard of the military effort. It says, Lo nishar adecha, no one was left of the Egyptians. But the Medrash says, it's ad velo ad bechla, which means no one was left except one. No nishar ad echad, meaning they were all killed ad echad until one. One did survive. According to the Medrash, that one, of course, was Paro himself. So says Ksava Kabbalah, that fits in exactly. Hashem said to Moshe, tell Paro that I'm keeping you alive and I'm setting, placing these, mo these osos, these signs in Egypt so that you, Paro, will tell your children and your grandchildren so that even you, Paro, will also be alive to, to witness it. The, the plagues are not, according to this view, they're not primarily punitive, although I'm sure there was an element of that as well. There was an element of divine justice that was meted out, but the primary, most exalted function was to demonstrate Hashem's existence. And we'll see more about that shortly. I don't mean to keep saying that, but let's go on to the next uh, uh, observation. And by the way, just parenthetically, uh, the this opinion about Paro who survived the even the, the drowning of the sea, that he's the one who did, he is the one who did survive, is found in another medrash who, where we have a further uh, like uh, additional um, uh, flourish, and that is that Paro survived and he lived perhaps a long time. The same Paro of the Exodus who learned his lesson apparently became the king in far off Nineveh. We don't even know where Nineveh was. There are a few um, possibilities, a few candidates for that designation. Nineveh was, and probably there were a number of cities named Nineveh as well. But in any case, I'm talking about the Nineveh about which Yonah was sent to prophesy. Yonah, Jonah and the whale. So he was sent to Nineveh and eventually after a number of uh, misadventures along the way, he did get to Ninveh, and he did prophesy about Ninveh. He prophesied against Ninveh. He rebuked them, and lo and behold, the king of Ninveh led the Teshuva movement, and the Torah says that because they repented and they relented, so they were spared, and according to the Medrash Pirkei de Rebeliezer, this was the same Paro from Egypt. He became king in Ninveh. And having learned his lesson, when Yonah came and prophesied in the name of the God of Israel, the king actually uh, uh, got the message. He got the memo. And he ensured that the whole city followed his lead. And as the, the book of Jonah describes, they were spared. So that's just as an additional uh, flourish. The uh, Ksava Kabbalah does not mention that medrash, but he does mention this tradition, according to that one opinion, that uh, Paro did survive. But he goes further, and he says that uh, the whole purpose of this mission, which is otherwise obscure, if you <clears throat> take a look at the first two verses, we've read them carefully. I don't want to do it again. We don't need to. You see that 
the Torah doesn't say explicitly what is the purpose. The way it's normally understood, Hashem says to Moshe, go to Paro, doesn't say what to do or what to say, but the implication is speak to him about warning him about the plagues. Because I've hardened his heart, well, why should he go to him? Because he's hardened his heart. Uh, and if it's just so that Moshe will, and the Jewish people will tell their progeny after them, then why does Moshe have to go to Paro to discuss that? Rather, he says that this idea of hardening Paro's heart, Artsko renders it here obstinate <clears throat> or uh, stubborn, the heart, his heart and the heart of his servant stubborn, it's not obstinacy. This is a novelty. Because the idea that God has hardened Pharaoh's heart gives rise to a philosophical problem that how could he intervene in his free will, which we can maybe speak about an, uh, another time. I have spoken about it in the past, but it's not for now. It's not for now because Ksavah Kabbalah has a different approach. He says, it does not mean that Hashem is hardening Pharaoh's heart, nor does it mean that Pharaoh is hardening his own heart, which we find earlier in the narrative. Rather, when it says, I will harden his heart, it means I will weigh heavily upon his heart. Here it says, I have made his heart heavy. I have given him heart problems. He's suffering heart palpitations. He's suffering, uh, 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 he's, uh, uh, he has um, acquired a heart condition, which is, um, besides perhaps can be understood literally or metaphorically, but it also symbolizes the extreme danger to his life. I'll read you a few words that Ksava Kabbalah says here and, and elsewhere. He says that uh, it means koshi yagon leiv, the heaviness, the hardness, the suffering of the anguish of the heart. Kovid masas, the heavy burden of dagas aleiv. He's under extreme pressure. He's desperate. His life and his world, his civilization is collapsing around him. His own advisors tell him, don't you know that Egypt is lost? Paro, and I'm not uh, trying to uh, arouse any sympathy for him, but he's feeling heavy of heart. He's feeling as if his, his world is collapsing around him. That's the meaning, I've struck his heart. Ksava Kabbalah says earlier, I'll strike him upon his heart, symbolizing I'll bring him to the brink of death. His life will be, he'll be in mortal danger. That's what I will do to Paro because of the punishments that will become upon him will bring him to the brink of death. So the Torah here is saying that what Moshe should say to Paro, why are you suffering this much? Why is Hashem doing this to you in order that you should tell, you should, you should realize and you should tell <clears throat> the future generations about this. Do you wonder if this worked? Do you wonder if Moshe's words fell on deaf ears or if in some way maybe Paro did transmit or the lesson was conveyed to mankind? Well, I don't want to uh, uh, engage in any uh, like history of religion at this point. I'll just make one observation. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille, the great American uh, um, film uh, producer, died, I think, in 1959, one of the fathers of the film industry uh, worldwide. His most famous film was called The Ten Commandments. I'm sure that you have heard of it. At the time, it won multiple awards, and it was, was one of the most commercially successful films of all time, remains one of the most successful of all times. It, it uh, netted uh, the, the gross take was well over in today's money, well over a billion dollars. What's my point? Why did he make that film? So some uh, wit said, why did he make the film The Ten Commandments? He thought, why waste 3,000 years of free publicity? The story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim is among the best known narratives, I, I would say, of all world literature. When he made a film, of course, it was skillful production and all of that. But the idea of harnessing the fact that this narrative, this account of what Hashem did in Egypt, the, the enslavement of the Jews and the Exodus, this is uh, a story which is part of world heritage, Lahavdil, I would say. Uh, Actually, I did a bit of research, easy to do nowadays. Do you know that ABC Network Television in America 
airs the film The Ten Commandments every year since 1974 on Shabbos Cholamoid Pesach, or the Shabbos around Pesach. They air it every single year. I don't know whether there's another film which has had that kind of longevity year after year. Again, my point is that this is a story which has legs. This is a story which goes on and on and its fame, its renown has not abated even now 3,300 years later. This is because, again, I don't wanna be facetious, one could say because of the success of this mission where Moshe went to Paro and he told him, you are here, you're only alive and you're suffering this much so that you tell the story. Xavier Kabbalah uh, takes this further as well. In that word, he's allowed uh, I told you that uh, art school renders it how I made a mockery of Egypt. Rashi says, Sihakti, Kamo ki he's allowed bi. That's what um, Bilam, said to his, his uh, donkey, uh, he said, because you've made a, a fool of me. Okay, that Rashi uh, cites some other evidence for that. Fine, that is the approach of, as I said, many, many Mephoshim. Says Ixama Kabbalah, if you look closely at Unculus, you'll see a different idea. Now it's interesting because Rashi very often follows Unculus. We're not always so uh, alert to it because the idea of translating the Hebrew into Aramaic so that we can understand it better is a bit anachronistic for us. We're most, for most of, in mo most of us are not fluent in Aramaic, myself included. And therefore, uh, if I understand the Hebrew well and good, the Aramaic, I don't necessarily think the Aramaic is going to help me with a Hebrew word I don't understand, but actually it often can. And take a look at Unculus. He says that, um, in in pasuk base and includes uvedil kadam barach uva barach so that you uh, tell your son and grandson yas nisin di avadis b'mitzrayim vas asvasadi shivisi v'hon v'seidun ad are an Hashem so he's allowed to. Uh, Unculus renders it yes, nisin the avadis b'mitzrayim the miracles that I did in Egypt. In other words, the word he's allowed to is associated with miracles. Says Xavier Kabbalah, evidently Unculus, the great uh, uh, Talmudic sage who was, according to our tradition, the Talmudic tradition, he actually was a convert, one of the righteous, important righteous proselytes of Jewish history. He understood the word, he's alauti from the word la'alot, to ascend. And he says that evidently that's why he says it's miracles and it's related according to Xavier, according to Unculus, he says that evidently Unculus understands it as relating to the from the word hit alot to elevate to exalt to like lord one's authority one's position of superiority we find that the word um like uh alila and i'll just mention to you a few places where we find it. Some are familiar to us. Kiruvu shmo hodiu va'amim alilo sab. Call in his name. Notify the nations alilo sab. The word alilo sab means his deeds, his actions. We have another person. Yodia derachav Moshe livnei Israel alilo sab. But the word alilo sab, his deeds, doesn't mean ever pedestrian or quotidian deeds. It means great deeds. It's used for deeds which are dramatic, which are either supernatural or demonstrate divine power. So the word alilotav, his deeds comes from the word al, meaning upon, above, exalted. So according to Targum Unculus, says Xavier Kabbalah, the word hit alalti, is a reflexive word. It means how I exalted myself. Hit alalti. I did wondrous, great, exalted acts. And as a result of that, I became known, revealed, and I was exalted. I exalted myself over Egypt. I show his alalti b'mitzrayim. Says Xavier Kabbalah, I want to add another possibility. He says, Lulei Dvarav. Uh, if he hadn't, if it weren't for his words, I would say the following, which means 
I've got a further idea, not necessarily that he's rejecting Unculus, but he says, I've got another idea, and I found this so fascinating. You know what? He says the word hit alauti may derive from the word ila. Ila is ayin yud lamid he. Ila v'siba. It means the cause of causes. Ilat ha-ilot v'sibat ha-sibot. What's his name? Uh, uh, Yishai uh, Rivo um, has a song. Uh, it's one of his famous songs. Sibat ha-sibot v'ilat ha-ilot. That is to say, which comes from the Zohar, by the way. It means that God is the first mover. God is the original cause. God is the cause of all causes. How I revealed myself as the ila. The word ila means the cause, the primal cause, the creator of all the universe. And this fits in so beautifully because according to what we've said, up till now, the point of this communication, that is to say, the message that Moshe brings to Paro is the suffering that you are experiencing, the dramatic demise of Egypt prog progressively, incrementally, plague after plague, is for the purpose of your realizing that God runs the world and you're telling others about it, the future generations as well. How I have revealed myself as the the first cause through Yitzhak Mitzrayim, God's existence and his divinity is revealed. He's allowed to be Mitzrayim. So according to Rashi, it means how I've made a mockery of Egypt. But according to Ksave Kabbalah, it means much something much more profound. I have been an Ela. I have revealed myself, my existence, and my mastery of the world has become known. And he doesn't quote this, which surprises me. But my friends, we all know this very well. We know very well that the departure from Egypt is the most dramatic and the classic proof to God's existence. How do we know? What are the Ten Commandments? The first one, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of Egypt. Why doesn't, and this question is asked in many classic sources, even Ezra says that Yehuda Levi asked him, why doesn't God say, I am the Lord your God who created heaven and earth? It's a more impressive item on his CV. Isn't that the most fundamental? So according to what Ksava Kabbalah is suggesting, the reason that Hashem says, I showed is that it's God's departure. It's the God taking the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, which is the, the means by which God's existence and mastery of the world is revealed to all mankind. And I go back to my comment about the Ten Commandments. That's just a, a small example. I mean, the film, <laughs> the, a small example of how true that is. I'm not saying that every human being uh, acknowledges it, but uh, the the uh, narrative, the account, the record, the, those events are, as I say, part of, of the, the, the human heritage, uh, if you think in those terms. This idea, Ksava Kabbal quotes it also from Rabbeinu Bechaya. He says, from Eretz Mitzrayim, uh, uh, from Egypt, that's when people began to know me. Because think about it, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, okay, Avram was involved in quite a lot of outreach. I'm not sure how successful he was in the long term. Uh, Yitzchak probably was not the same, uh, you know, uh, Kiruv maestro as Avram Avinu was. Yaakov, I'm sure he did his part, his sons, no doubt. But when Yaakov went to Mitzrayim, how many people were there? 70 souls. What about all of the Balei Tshuva? Uh, okay, we don't know what, what became of them. When the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt, again, God's mastery, God's existence was not widely known. Even the Jewish people themselves, we don't know how uh, firm what was their conviction. There's evidence to suggest possibly uh, their own faith had been uh, uh, fatally eroded. When did God become known to mankind? From Itzias Mitzrayim. So this is Esasher, his alalti. Esasher, his alalti, how I became revealed as the Ila Rishona, Ilat Ha'ilot, the Sibat Ha'sibot, 
the reason, the cause of all causes. We've got just a few minutes, and I want to share with you to end. Up, it's not so much a lighter note, but uh, uh, something a bit uh, simpler for the Hebraists here, especially. I know we've got several uh, in this year tonight who are Hebraists. So turn further with me. There's a lot to say in this parsha, but we're limited, of course, in our half an hour slot. Turn to, with me to page to chapter 12, verse 17. You can find it, if you're using the Art Scroll Chumash, you can find it on page 354. Here we have one of the very well-known drashot. Rashi mentions it, it's found in the Chazal. Ushmartem es hamatzos. So it's, it's, again, chapter 12, verse 17. You've got to read the Hebrew. In English, you'll never get the nuance. Ushmartem es hamatzos. You shall guard the matzot. Kivetzim hayomaz, etc. Ushmartem es hamatzos. Guard the matzos. So this has many halachic meanings. We've heard of shmura matza, etc. But Rashi make, uh, quotes a famous drash that Alti Kray, I think Rashi quotes it, certainly in the Gemara. Rashi quotes it, uh, rather the Gemara says, Alti Kray, Matzos Ela Mitzvos. Yeah, here it is. Rabbi Yishaya Omer, Alti Kore Esha Matzos Ela Esha Mitzvos. Alti Kray, Alti Kray, don't read it Matzos, but read it Mitzvos. That is to say, it's a drash. Doesn't mean don't read it the way it's written. Of course, you read it the way it's written. That is the correct meaning, and as we just mentioned, many halachic implications of that. It is a drash, that is to say, proposing a hinted a hint to a, an alternative, an additional uh, meaning, or rem is a hint. Ushmartem es hamitzvos, guard the commandments. Shmir es hamitzvos, guard the commandments. It's a drash. Says Iksava Kabbalah, even though this is a drash, that is to say, a homiletic interpretation, which no doubt is uh, something uh, additional to the, safe, the straightforward meaning, don't imagine that it's completely conjectural or completely like uh, uh, whimsical to say ah, matzot, mitzvot, they sound quite similar, maybe just for, as I say, reasons of uh, uh, the similar sound that uh, there, there's a drash, there. there's something more to it as well. So there's something very, I think uh, Hegyoni very reasonable. He says the word mitzvah comes from the word tzav. Tzav means command. There's even a portion in the Torah known as tzav, uh, and uh, yes, Parshas tzav about the Kohanim regarding the Karban Ola, which is an all burnt offering. So Rashi says there that the word tzav is something which requires ziruz. Ziruz is urgency, like, like uh, uh, um, encouragement. The word mitzvah comes from the word tzav, meaning command, and the word tzav is derived from the word itza. Itza, aleph, yud, tzadi, hey. It means the ur urging to do something. Uh, someone who instructs, uh, he, he's an, an officer in the army, or he's a line manager, he's a foreman on a work site, he instructs one of the employees to do something. So the word sab to instruct or to command is related to an itza, which means to urge, to do something either quickly, urgently, it's something which is important. That's the nature of the word sab. You know, you can tell someone to do a job, but you can command him or instruct him. It has a an implication of greater urgency. He says the word matzah, of course, derives from the same idea. Matzah is itza umihirut, uh, to urge, to encourage, to do something uh, quickly, urgently, assiduously. Of course, the matzot have to be made uh, with care, but also in, in with, with alacrity. Otherwise, if the matzah is allowed to languish, it will become chametz. The difference between matzah and chametz can be just a drop of ink between the hay and the ches. And the point is that mitzvot comes from the word sav or tzivui, which in turn derives from the word itza, is to urge or to do something quickly. And therefore, actually, there's a close logical connection between the word matzot and the word mitzvot. They may share the common theme of itza, meaning to do something uh, urgently, quickly, to do it in an assiduous manner. And a person who loves the mitzvot, of course, he will do the mitzvot in that way, in an alacritous fashion, in a conscientious fashion. And that is hinted to in the word itza. 
and the word mitzvah and the word matzah, mitzvot and matzot, have that common theme. It's not just they sound similar. Actually, there is a logical bond, a logical commonality that joins them. And I found that to be a very uh, a clever insight, as I say, quite to me, to my mind, quite uh, logical and even compelling. I know we like to sum up, so let's do that. Uh, we said boel paro, it means bring these words to paro, come to paro bearing the message that he, I've hardened his heart, meaning I've grieved his heart and the hearts of his servants. And I brought all of this, this uh, sort of uh, devastation upon him so that he gets a message. The purpose of the Makot is not just to release the Jewish people and he can think, well, I've resisted, I've resisted. That's not the point. The primary point of the Makot is to demonstrate God's mastery over heaven and earth. And that indeed was accomplished so that Paro himself will tell his descendants so that the Egyptians, Egypt symbolizing the Gentile world, will know of the uh, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. We mentioned maybe whimsically that Sisobi de Mill, I'm sure without realizing it, was part of that process. The Ten Commandments broadcast by ABC Pesach time every year since 1974. Uh, we said his alalti can be understood as deriving the word ila, which means cause or source. That hit alalti means I have revealed myself as the prime cause, the first cause, the, the uh, uh, source from which all the universe derives. And then lastly, just now we said, it's not just they sound similar. Actually, logically, they have a commonality to do something with alacrity, to do it carefully, assiduously, as if someone is urging you to do something very important and very uh, time sensitive for the betterment of the individual and the cause of Klal Yisrael and indeed all of mankind because mitzvahs make the world go round. Thank you very much. I wish you Shabbat Shalom. I hope everyone had a good break. I should have said at the very beginning. And we uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week. If not sooner, if not sooner. Shabbat Shalom the Kulam. Shabbat Shalom. Can I just ask you, Rabbi? Sure. I, I don't know, I've got in my head, Zeresis. What's, what's the actual translation of that? Yeah, so and is that linked? Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the word Zeresis means um, to, do, to do something uh, alacrit. Uh, it means alacritous, alacrity. So you're quite right. It's very closely related. We have an expression, Zerizim makdimim the mitzvahs. Those who are alacritous, they do mitzvahs, uh, uh, you know, quickly, promptly. With prompt, it's, yeah. it's exactly the same idea because the word mitzvah has in its etymological roots the notion of something which should be done urgently, assiduously. So yes, zrizut is a very important thing. And of course, matzah is a prime example of something which must be done uh, in haste. It was uh, the first matzah, of course, was uh, accomplished in haste. And year by year, if you ever go to a matzah factory, you'll see it's done uh, uh, quickly. This is the matzah. So you're quite right, zrizut is all part of it. Thank you. Thank you.